How many of the word can minister to us? I mean, the word ministers to us. It builds us up. It strengthens us. It divides, Hebrew says, between soul and spirit. You know what that means? It means when our emotions are stirred up about something, it can separate all of the things our emotions are saying from the, what the spirit is saying to us. How many ever have a hard time hearing the Lord when you're stirred up emotionally about something? That's what the word does. It's like a sword. It builds us up. It strengthens us. It's like bread. So I want to... Uh, we want to just lean into the ministry of the word this morning. This morning, where am I? Nine o'clock at night. <laughs> I'm in preacher mode. Um, but I want to do this. I don't do this very often at all, but just in response to Sherry's word, and I believe that that's the Lord. While I'm speaking, and I'm going to speak for, you know, for a little bit here, uh, and you're welcome to leave at any moment. I know it gets late on Friday, but uh, while I'm speaking, if you feel the Lord touch you, you feel the Lord, you'll feel like, him rest on your shoulders. You'll feel him press against your chest like this, and you'll just feel sparked. I just want you to stand to your feet when, you, when that happens, and we're going to pause and bless it. I just want to see what the Father's doing and bless it. We'll bless it, and you can sit back down, okay? So, and if it gets real charismatic in here, that's, that's what it'll be. <laughs> okay. All right. Good, 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 good. I really do believe um, that I have a word for some people tonight. And so I want to really just lean into this together. So we're, uh, as, a, as a family, Maps Global family, we've been in a series uh, for the last four weeks, I think, called The Blueprint, where we're looking at the church in Antioch. And uh, many people, you might have never heard a sermon on the church in Antioch in Acts 11 and Acts 13. Uh, some of you maybe, maybe didn't even know that was in the New Testament, the church in Antioch. But the church in Antioch was arguably uh, one of the most important churches in church history. Uh, specifically, what transpired at Antioch uh, really was the most significant shift in the New Testament. And I'll tell you why in a second. But uh, the reason we've been going through this is I believe that the church in Antioch is a blueprint or a prototype for what God wants to raise up across the earth right now. I'll say it this way. I believe Antioch is what church is gonna look like in the days ahead. And so we've been looking at the, uh, at the church in Antioch together, and I want to just stay in that vein tonight uh, <clears throat> and uh, talk about the environment or the, we call it the greenhouse, but what happens in the environment at Antioch. Antioch became the hub. It was the hub, the apostolic hub of the New Testament. It was the first place where Jews and Gentiles uh, were in the same church together. It was the first multi-ethnic church. In fact, it was the first place where Gentiles expressed Christianity or, or church. Uh, we had Cornelius' house, but where a church was formed around it was in Antioch. So how many of you are, are not Jewish in this room? Raise your hand high. Okay, so that means Antioch is a prototype for what church looks like for us as Gentiles. Well, there's a lot of things we can pull from the church in Jerusalem, but church in Jerusalem was a Messianic church. It was almost almost exclusively Jewish, Messianic. But the church in Antioch was the first time that Gentiles were living out the, their expression of Christianity. It was the first Gentile church. And uh, additionally, Antioch was the place where racism, the wound of racism, was confronted and healed in the New Testament. There's much to say on that. It was also the place where the first uh, people in the New Testament were identified as prophets, so every reference to prophets in the New Testament until Acts 11 was, was uh, referencing Old Testament prophets. The first time someone was called a New Testament prophet was when Antioch. It's amazing. Luke, yeah, it's amazing. Luke puts the office of the prophet on display, Luke wrote the book of Acts, at Antioch, which means there was new, when we look to how New Testament prophecy is to work inside of a community, how is it be weighed and judged, we should look at Antioch. And so uh, we get an expression, the first expression of the prophetic ministry, the office of the prophet, multiple times actually in Antioch. In fact, within those two chapters, Acts 11 and 13, prophet is mentioned multiple times. And then uh, Antioch was the first place where disciples were called Christians. It's the first place in, in history where the disciples were called Christians, little Christs is what it means in the Greek. Yeah, Christians. And uh, that name, that term that they embraced and created language for, we're still using that term today. Isn't that crazy? 2,000 years later, we're still calling ourselves by what the, the, the word that they 
discovered at Antioch, or the word that they started at Antioch. That's crazy to me. In some way, we're still part of the legacy of Antioch. We still call ourselves by the same name. That's crazy to me. And Antioch was the first place where the, a, a community engaged with the Great Commission. It was the missionary, it was the hub, it was the headquarters, and it sent the first missionary in the Bible, which was the Apostle Paul. I mean, if you know, may have not known that, but the Apostle Paul, his home base was Antioch. And that's what we're going to talk about tonight a little bit, is Paul's journey to Antioch. And I'm, I'm calling it Bruised Reeds and Broken Leaders. Because I believe that many across the body of Christ, across the earth right now, are in a place right now in their life like Saul, Paul Saul, like Saul was in Tarsus right before Barnabas brought him to Antioch. And so I want to speak into that because I believe that there's a whole generation that is about to get ignited for the Great Commission, for the gospel and the worth of Jesus. And the Lord is looking for Antiochs to send them so they get their destinies repaired and launched into their assignment. There's a whole generation running around right now with a book of prophetic words because they went to 10 conferences. They got prophetic words, but they have no idea how those words work together and they haven't been put in a family where they can get developed, healed, restored, and launched. And so they're just like walking around going, what do I do with this? And they're carrying all kinds of church pain and leader pain. And they're salt and Tarsus right now. And God's about to go snatch up the souls that are in Tarsus right now and bring them to Antioch. It's true. (laughs) The greatest contributor to Christianity, especially in the first century, the spread of Christianity through the Roman world, uh, came out of Antioch, the Apostle Paul. The guy who wrote most of your New Testament, the Apostle Paul, came out of Antioch. Antioch was the environment that nurtured, healed, and launched Paul. And he set out, Romans 15, to, to make it his ambition to preach Christ where he had not yet been named. And that ambition, that Work, that endeavor, that task is what I'm looking for. That task that Paul set out to start, we're still carrying that task today. It's called the Great Commission. And it's my conviction that the generation that's gonna finish the task of the Great Commission, meaning they take the gospel to every ethno-linguistic people group, every nation of the earth, that generation is gonna be nurtured, healed, and launched out of the same environment that Paul was nurtured, healed, and launched out of. Do you understand? Which is why God's gonna be raising up Antioch sending centers across the earth. There's gonna be a thousand of them across the earth because what it's gonna take to finish the Great Commission in this hour is not just one or two apostles. It's gonna take a whole generation that sees the word of Jesus and says, here am I, send me. I believe the blueprints for what church is gonna look like in the next 10, 20 years are found in Acts 11 and 13 concerning Antioch and these Antioch sending centers, presence-centered families, nurturing and sending laborers to neighborhoods and nations. The Holy Spirit right now across the earth, across the body of Christ, I see this, we did it tonight, I see it in Iraq, I see it in Eurasia, I see it in the Middle East, I hear it in closed countries, I hear it in communist countries, I hear it in democratic countries, I hear it in Muslim countries, The Holy Spirit is restoring the beauty of Jesus, the centrality of the man Jesus Christ to his church. And God's insisting that we allow the Holy Spirit to have his way. (laughs) And what that's doing, when we say, yes, you know what, Holy Spirit, actually it's your room, not ours. You're the leader, you're the teacher, you're the counselor, you're the advocate, you're the one. You're the guide. The Holy Spirit, it's your room. And Holy Spirit goes, well, you know what I wanna do? I wanna magnify the beauty of the man Jesus. I wanna put him in the center of everything you do. You know what that's gonna create on the earth? Unceasing worship. Because the Holy Spirit wants to recreate recreate on earth as it is in heaven. And it's happening all over the earth right now. Present-centered families, nurturing and sending laborers to neighborhoods and nations. Now, here we go. Stay in Isaiah 42. I'm gonna put a verse on the screen, and I wanna look a little bit 
And what I believe God's doing right now for many across the body of Christ. Ephesians 2, verse 10, if you could put it up there, thank you so much. Paul, the guy who was launched out of Antioch, later writes to Ephesus, he says, we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which he prepared beforehand that we should walk in. Now there's a couple operative words we need to look at that, and stay with me, because we're gonna get, I think we're gonna land some are really important. Paul says, we are his workmanship, the word workmanship in the Greek is poema. Poema is the word workmanship. Poema is the word that is used for a master craftsman when they begin to create a work of art or weave together a fabric, a beautiful fabric. It's called a poema. It's a workmanship, it's a work of art. Uh, it's used in architecture, it's, it's used in making fabrics and rugs and, and uh, clothes. It, it, it's similar to the word, if you say poema, what does it sound like a little bit? Poem, that's right. It's similar to crafting a poem or a song. And Paul says, you know what happened through the finished work of the cross? You know what, when we were born again and recreated in Christ Jesus, you know what happened is that God put us on a track or a destiny track that he wrote beforehand for us. It was like a work of art. Do you know your life, your destiny is like a work of art before heaven? It's like a song that God wrote. It's like a beautiful piece of architecture. Your little life, God, went, in Psalm 139, says that God knitted it together and wrote every day. Every day he wrote about your destiny. You know what that means? that there is no insignificant days in your life. Every one of the days that you wake up, God has written a destiny track for. That means all of life is holy. And Paul says, we are his poema, his fabric, his beautiful piece of art, his song that he's written. He created us in Christ Jesus for this. He prepared it beforehand, but here's the, the next operative word, and we should walk in it. Which means that we have the ability not to walk in it. It's an invitation to walk out the beauty of the destiny track, but the way we live, the decisions we make, we can actually start to live in dissonance to that melody. The way we spend our time, our money, our thoughts, our energy, our words towards each other. In fact, Paul uh, in Ephesians 4 says that when we speak words to each other, we ha actually have the ability to wound each other's destiny track with our words. The way we live is either in harmony with the melody that God wrote over our lives, or it's in dissonance, it's sour notes. <clears throat> we should walk in it. Our poema, or our destiny track, now let me just be really clear, because I think there's been so much talk about, you know, do your dream and your destiny. Let me be really clear about what I mean when I say your destiny track. Your destiny, what does it mean to be, when I say your destiny? Your destiny is to be a wholehearted lover of God. And if you stay in it, that is what you're going to become. A wholehearted lover of God. Jesus is gonna, is, has formed your life and the Holy Spirit is leading you down a track and the end result is that your heart is gonna be on fire with love for God. That's what he asked for before you went to the cross, right? That they would love me like the Father loves me. God's gonna give Jesus what he asked for. Your destiny is to be a wholehearted lover of God. Number two, it's to be conformed into the image of Jesus. That's your destiny. If you stick on that track, you know who you're gonna look like when you're 50 and 60 and 70? You're gonna look like Jesus. People are gonna get from you what they got when they came to Jesus. That's your destiny. 
That's what the Holy Spirit is forming in you right now. Is that people would get from you what they got when they came to Jesus. That's your destiny. Number three, when I say your destiny, what I mean is there are assignments that God has placed in front of you that if you walk them out, it will glorify God in the earth. It's John 15. Jesus said, you didn't choose me, but I chose you, that you would go, bear, go and bear fruit and that your fruit would remain. And he said this, that you would bear much fruit that the Father would be glorified. There are assignments on your track. And let me just tell you, if you've been around long enough, you know, there's not just one assignment. There's lots of assignments. Assignments change. Hey, anybody been around long enough to know assignments change? That's why we get it. our calling has to be rooted in being lovers of God because our assignments are gonna change. But God has put assignments down your track that if you stay in harmony with that melody line that God's written, you're gonna step into assignments that are gonna magnify and glorify God on the earth. And your assignments that Jesus has put on your track really have little to do with the amount of resources you currently have. It has very little to do with what personality type that you've tested as. I mean, it's good to know that. It's good to be self-aware because, you know, you, know, you want to know what it's like on the other side of you, you know. That's helpful. <laughs> That's helpful for everybody involved if you know what it's like on the other side of you. But Jesus isn't going, well, you know what, I can only use Enneagram mates for that assignment. No, that's not how he works. <laughs> He's put assignments, and the reason it glorifies God when we walk out those assignments is people look at it and they go, how in the world did she ever do that? That's right. That's right. How in the world did he ever do that? And they go, it must be God. <laughs> That's, right. That's what they said about the apostles. Right. Remember in Acts chapter two? Remember? They, they stood up, it was Acts, uh, Acts four. They stood up in front of the Sanhedrin, they preached, and it says, the, the, the leader said, wait, aren't the, isn't these the Galileans, the guys from Galilee? And I was like, this is rednecks from up, up north. Man, they sound a little, and, and they, it says, and they realized they were uneducated men. I get in, I'm there. <laughs> uneducated men, and then here's the, second, here's the second phrase. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. What happens when Jesus puts assignments down our destiny track is we step into things and steward things that we have no business being a part of and what it does is it makes Jesus look big. I'm not talking about do your dream. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about surrender and go low and let Jesus magnify himself through you. <laughs> That's not what I'm saying. Okay, on, so... Okay, I just, I just want to be clear when I say destiny. Somebody's like, well, I'm going to be yeah, an, an all-star. It's like awesome. Well, just, just go as low as you can and see if God raises you up. What happens, though, in life is that the enemy, our own hearts, and other people are trying to knock us off of that destiny track. They're trying to, we, our own hearts accuse us. Anybody there? John, John said later, if, you're, if your heart accuses you, don't worry, there's somebody greater than your heart. <laughs> I mean, you're glad that Jesus is stronger than your own heart. Sin Sin patterns can bruise and knock us off of our destiny track. Secret sin could take us out. See, that's what a lot of people, especially in this generation, they go, well, it didn't hurt anybody. It's not hurting anybody. It's killing you. It is searing your conscience and your soul and you're becoming less tender to the voice of God and when you become less tender to the voice of God, you can't discern the destiny track. Doesn't matter if nobody else knows you're staying on your phone late at night looking at all that stuff. It didn't hurt anybody. It's killing your soul. Jesus. It matters. 
Hebrews 4 said, bitterness will take you off your destiny track. In fact, it says that um, Esau, because of bitterness and jealousy, sold his birthright and he could never get it back. Because of bitterness. It says he sought for it with tears and could not get it back. Jacob did not steal Esau's destiny. He took himself out by harboring bitterness. Fear, shame, we talked about it tonight. Shame and fear will cause us to shrink back from taking bold steps of faith because fe- shame tells us that we, don't, we can't have confidence before God, that he loves us and enjoys us and he's made us. Shame, goes, shame causes us to hide in the garden and put the, fig le- the leaves around us and hide from God. Fear tries to knock us off our destiny track by, not, by causing us not to respond in faith when, when Jesus calls us, when Jesus says, move this way. You gotta move. If you shrink back in fear, you're gonna get knocked off. You're gonna start to live in dissonance to the poema. You know what I think maybe what, one of the greatest enemies right now in this generation to the destiny track of God on their lives. You know what it is? The deception of opportunity. The illusion that we have lots of different opportunities. It's what wealth does in a society. It causes us to be blind to the voice of God, the call of God in our destiny. This is what happened in Mark 10 when the rich young ruler came to Jesus. He said, Lord, what do I do to be saved, to join the team? I want to jump on. She said, great, sell everything because you can't take in that with, with you. You need to follow me. And it says he walked away sad because he had much possessions. The illusion that he had many opportunities made Jesus' call one among the opportunities that he was to evaluate. I believe this generation is under the illusion that they have many opportunities. I had this dream I've been thinking about this dream all day. I had this dream a while back. And uh, in the dream, I was standing like this, and I was looking into two different rooms. I was like standing. I don't know how it works. You know how dreams work. It's like I'm standing, I'm, and, and there's two different rooms, and there's two different young women. I understood it to be like the, the representation, representatives of this generation. They were standing in the rooms like this. And I was standing outside looking in these rooms, and I was shouting to them. And I said this. I said, if God calls you, you must respond. I said, if God calls you, you must respond. I was crying out. And I said the third time, if God calls you, you must respond because there's no guarantee he'll call you again. You know what the deceitfulness of riches, wealth and opportunity within a society, you know why that's such an enemy to our souls? Is because when the voice of Jesus comes and says, move this way, we go, I'll consider it, but I have other opportunities. And the God who made heaven and earth, can you imagine that the God who made heaven and earth is actually interested in calling you to something? The Genesis 1 God calling little you to something. And we go, yeah, I know, but I got a couple of other opportunities I'm thinking about. The delusion. And it knocks us off our destiny track. This is a word to somebody in this room. If God calls you, you must respond. You can't sit back and, well, I'll think about it maybe next year. Jesus. Because God's working on a timeline. He's moving forward. And if you say no and you sit back, you're going to find yourself off the destiny track and you're going to go the long way around and you're going to be in a bunch of unnecessary pain. Just let me tell you. From experience, let me tell you. You got to respond. When Jesus says, go this way, you got to go that way.
Other people around us can wound us. Not can. Other people around us will wound us. How many of you have never been hurt by anyone before? Raise your hand. Okay, great. We're all on the same page then. People will wound us. All of these things, sin, fear, shame, the delusion that we have all these opportunities and Jesus' call is just one of them. Other people, Satan accusing us, all of these things, they're working to try to knock us off of that poema. The way Isaiah, we made it there, Isaiah 42, here we are. The way Isaiah describes it is that these things, they bruise us and they cause passion in our hearts to grow cold. He described it like a faintly burning wick. You ever seen one of those? You ever seen a candle and it burns down and all there's left on the end is just that little orange glow right at the end of it? It's so fragile. That's how Isaiah describes when we start, we get knocked off our destiny track and passion for Jesus and passion to be in his will, it starts to grow cold and apathy causes us to sideline. Bruised reeds, he says. You know what a bruised reed is? It's, if, you, if you've seen these, it's actually fascinating. You know, reeds that grow up in marshes, they're like these stalks, these plants that grow up strong. <clears throat> But they're very fragile. If you come by and you, and you knock it on the side, it, it, what it does is you bruise it. It doesn't break. It just bends over like this. It's wounded. It's bruised. Those same things in, in, in Isaiah's day, those reeds, they used to cut them down. And they put them, they made them into flutes. They made them into musical instruments. And so some, some commentators, when they talk about bruised reeds, it's not just the, it's both the reeds that can't stand up straight. They've been bruised. They're leaning over. They're wounded. But they're also, they don't make the right melody. The sound, the right sound doesn't come out. That's what a bruised reed does. And Jesus has something to say to us when we get bruised and we're leaning over, when we don't, we're not standing in confidence in what God said to us and what God said about us, when passion is growing cold, it's going dim in our hearts and that, that used to be a flame and now it's just growing into a little ember, Jesus, calls that injustice. Jesus said, Jesus says, that's a justice issue to me because I wrote the story for your life. I wrote the book. I wrote your destiny track. And when you get wounded and broken and, and you get snu and your, your passion starts to grow cold, Jesus goes, that's a justice issue to me. Look at this, Isaiah 42. Verse one, behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. This will be the same one just a few chapters later in Isaiah 61 that the spirit of the sovereign Lord will rest upon. It's the same one. It's just the anointed one where the spirit's gonna rest upon him. He will bring forth justice in the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break. And a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. 
See, we have been conditioned to only think of justice in terms of legislation. But from heaven's perspective, justice is the repairing of people's destinies. See, we, we say a justice prayer movement and we think about changing a law, but it's not the law for the law's sake, it's the law because people's destinies are at stake. Jesus says, it's justice to me that people who are bruised and broken would stand up straight in confidence and, to what I've call, and walk into what I've called them to do. People that are discouraged and they're like a faintly burning wick, it's justice to me that I would ignite their passion again and they would walk in their destiny track. It's justice to me. It says, he will bring forth justice in the nations. And then I love this. Isaiah goes, he's going to stick with it too. He's not going to get discouraged with you on your journey. He's not going to grow faint and weary like, oh my gosh, like, oh, again, like, oh, like I died for you, can you just get it right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> no, it says he's gonna stick with you. He's not gonna grow weary with you on your journey. He's committed at every turn to get you back in the, to the poema. He's so committed to you that he didn't just pay for your sin, he brought you into himself. Put his very nature inside of you and says, I'm sticking with you through this thing. He didn't just go, okay, I'm gonna wipe a little dirt off your shirt, go on your merry way, try not to sin. No, he goes, you know what he did to you on the, on the cross? He opened up his wounded side, wrapped himself around you, and not just you, the whole world, wrapped himself around you, went into the grave, came out, you came out with him, united with him forever. You can't get rid of him. It's no longer I who live, but who? Christ in me. And the life that I now live, I live by what? Faith in the Son of God. Paul says to Timothy, he goes, <laughs> I love this. He says, this saying is trustworthy. If we've died with him, not he died for us, we died with him. Christ on the cross, you put in, the, in him on Christ on the cross. With him you died. Then we shall also what? Live. If we endure, which is the active verb of the Christian life, if we endure, we will also Reign with him. That's Paul's eschatology. Endure now, reign later. Just so you know. There's a reigning coming, but right now it's enduring. If we deny him, if we say, you know what? I'm through with you. I want out. I'm walking away. And we press in to sin patterns, we rebel against him. He said, I don't want your word. I don't want, your, I don't want to hear your voice. I don't, want to hear the, I don't want to feel the conviction of the spirit. I'm going my own way. He will let us go because forced love is not the highest form of love. It's slavery. He goes, I created you. I purchased you. I wooed you. But you have the ability, only you have the ability to walk away. Because if we deny him, he will deny us. But if we are faithless, <laughs> if we are faithless, anybody have one of those days before? Anybody have one of those weeks before? Faithless. You know what faithless is? A bruised reed. It's just been knocked out. A faintly burning wick. You're discouraged. Your heart's struggling. 
They go, God, I just want to love you. I want to stay in it, but I'm just discouraged and got church pain. Hurting. It didn't turn out like I thought it would turn out. I'm hurting. If we are faithless, he will remain faithful because he cannot deny himself. <laughs> you know what that means? It means when we get bruised and broken and discouraged, he doesn't walk away. David says in Psalm 23, you'll know this, right? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you are with me. Which means Jesus doesn't take a detour around dark valleys while we walk through it. If we are faithless, if we are bruised, if we stumble, we blow it, fall into sin, but we go, God, I, I want to, if we run back to him, God, I want to, you know what he'll do? Keep himself wrapped around us. And this is what he does with bruised reeds. You know how you fix a bruised reed? It's bent over, you gotta stand it back up, and then you gotta gently hold it in place long enough for strength to come back into it. it doesn't happen overnight. If we are faithless, if we are discouraged, if we've been wounded, you know what he does? He comes gently around us, stands us back up, and holds us long enough until we're confident again. You know what he does when that wick starts to burn out and there's just a little ember? Do you know how gentle you have to be to, to be able to revive an ember that's just about to go out? Do you know how forensically precise you have to be to get the... So gentle, just to get it a little bit, okay, a little bit more, a little bit more. Nurtures and to get it, okay, it's burning a little bit hotter, a little bit hotter, and he stays with us until it becomes a flame again. It's justice. Justice to Jesus. When faith, hope, and love are just an ember, he comes with gentleness, kindness. When our hearts are broken, you know what the Bible says that God does with the brokenhearted? What does it say? He draws near. This is why in Isaiah 42, 10, the nations are singing. They're singing. See, when we think about the nations, we gotta think about more than just a concept. It's like the nations, it's a map. No, you know what the nations are? It's people. <laughs> and the song that is coming out of the nations at the end of the age is a song that is coming out of a people who were bruised, broken, almost snuffed out, and Jesus came. It's a song of justice. It's the song of the one who's brought justice. That same anointed one in Isaiah 42 is the same one in Isaiah 61 who binds up the brokenhearted. You know what it means to bind up something? Has anybody ever broke their arm before? My son broke his arm once. He fell off the back of it. He was sitting on top of the swing set. I shouldn't tell you this. Just flew backwards, broke his arm. You know what, what they do with something that's broken? What do they do? 
They put a cast on it. They surround it. And they hold it in place until it can heal. What does it mean that Jesus binds up the brokenhearted? It means when you get your heart shattered by circumstances, when you get your heart shattered by expectations that are not met, when you get your heart shattered by someone else, you know what he does? He comes and surrounds it and holds it still until it can heal. Binds it up. Jesus is after binding up hearts, breaking oppression, and strengthening bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. That is going to be the result of the gospel touching the nations. Now, why do I tell you that? I'm telling you all of that to tell you this. When Jesus reconciled us to God, he put us into himself on the cross and it says he reconciled us to God. He didn't just reconcile your person he also began to reconcile your history to your destiny. He also began to rewrite your history in order to get you back into the poema. See, the decisions you made as your old person were just all over the place. They knocked you, you were not living according to the poema. Jesus stepped, intervened in your life. And then he began to rewrite all of the years that were wandering from him and he began to reconcile it or align it or weave it back in to your poema, to your destiny track. He didn't just reconcile you, he's reconciling your history. He's also reconciling your family's history. What happened here in Antioch in Acts 11, verse 25, this verse for me is the first of all it's for me it's the verse that changes all of history I know that there's 66 books of verses that change history I get it but this one this verse changes all of history and what's happening is Jesus is beginning to reconcile, he's beginning to strengthen, he's beginning to heal a bruised reed, and he's beginning to reconcile a man's history with his destiny, and he's putting it on display for us. Look at this, Acts eleven twenty five. 25. So Barnabas went to Tarsus to look for Paul, and when he had found him, he brought him to Antioch. That verse changed all of history. So you see, Saul was in Tarsus because he, let me give you a little history on Saul so we can just track with this. Acts chapter nine, he's on the road to Damascus. He's persecuting Christians. He's on a campaign, a crusade, right? And Jesus stepped in, right? Jesus stepped in. He hears the voice. He sees the light. He hears the voice. He goes blind. And Jesus, the man Jesus, later in 1 Corinthians 15, he said, I saw the man. I'm, I had the same encounter with the man that Peter has. Jesus steps in and all of a sudden shifts Paul's life and the trajectory of Paul's life. He goes into Damascus, they pray for him, he, his eyes get healed, scales fall off, and then he immediately goes and starts trying to preach in Damascus. And he gets kicked out of every synagogue he's going to. And he's like, okay, God anointed me, I got this prophetic word to go to be an apostle to the Gentiles. That was what Jesus told him on the road to Damascus. I have a prophetic word to be an apostle. He's like, let's get this thing started, put the banner up, we're doing the crusade. <laughs> Every place he went, he gets kicked out. Finally, he goes, you know what? I think I need to do some unlearning before I'm launching into this thing. And so he goes into the wilderness of Arabia for three years, is what it says in Galatians 1. You know where Arabia is? What comes to your mind when you think Arabia? Huh? Desert, that's right, wilderness. There's nothing out there. Paul goes for three years into Arabia to unlearn everything he learned as a Pharisee and to learn to sit at the feet of Jesus like the apostles did. And he's sitting there, and it says in Galatians 1 that he didn't get the gospel by a man, but by a revelation of Jesus Christ. 
He's got prophetic encounter after prophetic encounter. He's got the word from Jesus himself that he's gonna be an apostle to the Gentiles. After three years, he goes, all right, now we're gonna get this party started, and he goes up to Jerusalem, Acts chapter nine. He needs the endorsement of the other leaders. He needs them to write a letter. He wants to belong to the team, so he goes up to Jerusalem, and no one wants to meet with him. It literally says that Peter and James said, I can't get a meeting right now. They won't give him the time of day. They won't listen to his story. They won't endorse him. In fact, Barnabas, and then that's where Barnabas got him and took him to Peter and said, Barnabas said, you really need to listen to this guy's story. Then he starts trying to preach in Jerusalem and it says the brothers put him on a ship and sent him to Damascus. I mean, to Tarsus. You know what that means? Please go home. That's what it means. Tarsus is where he grew up. They go, Paul, we like your zeal. We think you have a cool story, but you need to go home. Just go home, man. And they sent him home. Yes. And for 14 years, he was in Tarsus. 14 years sitting on a prophetic word from Jesus himself. 14 years with a book of prophetic counters that he has no one to share with. 14 years where he's got to figure out what to do with his life now because he imagined he'd be rolling in ministry and now he's got to figure out how to make money so he starts making tents. 14 years Wounded by leaders. Church pain. Paul had church pain, you know that? Church pain. Confusion about his prophetic destiny. Here's what's really gnarly. Some scholars believe uh, Paul, most believe that he was married at some point because uh, he wouldn't have been that high up in the, in, in, the, uh, in the Pharisees without being married. There's only two options for what happened to Paul's wife. She either passed away, she died, or she left him when he became a believer. And if she left him, then she would have gone to his parents. If that's the case, Paul, after being wounded by leaders, not getting an endorsement, not figuring out how to get his ministry started, he would have had to go home and face a woman who is estranged from him because he tried to follow Jesus. How intense is that? With mom and dad going, oh, you're back. <laughs> Didn't work out for you? Okay, what are you gonna do now? What's your plan? I don't know, I'm just, I need to hear from the Lord. Well, what's your plan? I don't know, I'm just trying to hear from God. I don't know what's good. Well, what's your plan? Because you can't stay here. A bruised reed, a faintly burning wick. Can you imagine the apostle Paul the guy who wrote Ephesians sitting in a booth in the mall sewing tents together. Going, I don't know if I even, I don't even know if I believe in that prophetic word anymore. Barnabas goes to Antioch, sees what's happening. And Barnabas goes, there's something here. There's a greenhouse happening. It's gonna launch laborers. And Barnabas remembers a conversation 14 years earlier. And it says he goes and looks for the Paul. And when he found him, he brought him to Antioch. Here's what's shocking to me. First of all, Barnabas went and got him, so he searched for him. Can you imagine that conversation? Barnabas walks into the mall. Paul's sitting at the, you know, the booth in the middle of it. Barnabas goes, hey, apostle. Paul goes, That's, that ain't me, man. That ain't me. I tried that. Couldn't get the endorsement. They wouldn't invite me to the conference. <laughs> that ain't me. Barnabas goes, bro, you told me that Jesus said that to you. Bro, I don't even know if that was Jesus. Who knows? Barnabas goes, you told me Jesus said that to you. 
You've got a prophetic word over your life, man. You've got a destiny track, and you're off of it right now. Paul goes, well, where am I going to go? They don't want me in Jerusalem. Barnabas says, well, there's another place. There's a new place. There's a new outpouring. And you're sitting here on the sidelines. Barnabas goes, get back into the game, man. Barnabas Paul goes, I don't know. Barnabas goes, you better get in my donkey cart and come with me right now. <laughs> Barnabas puts that one on his shoulders and carries him up to Antioch. He walks into Antioch, right? And they walk in there to the prayer room in Antioch because they're ministering to the Lord. They walk into the prayer room. Barnabas walks in. Everybody goes, oh, hey, Barnabas, you're back. That's awesome. And Barnabas goes, hey, I want to introduce you guys to someone. And Barnabas steps aside, and guess who's standing behind him? Saul of Tarsus. Time out. Do you know why they are in Antioch in the first place? Because they were scattered over the persecution of Stephen. Do you know who led the persecution to Stephen over Stephen? Saul of Tarsus. Barnabas steps aside, and the guy that's responsible for the last 15 years of pain, loss, loss of property, loss of family members, they've been wandering around for about a decade trying to find a new home, and the guy who's single-handedly responsible for that just walked in the room. Can you imagine? <laughs> Barnabas goes, looky here. Everybody goes, oh my God, it's Saul of Tarsus. Now, flip it, Saul of Tarsus walks in, bruised, broken, maybe he can believe again, and he walks into a room, and he's face to face with his worst moment. He's looking in the eyes of family, men, women, and children, that he is personally responsible for their pain. And they're standing there in the prayer room, looking at each other. <laughs> it's you. Paul goes, it's me. <laughs> and what happens in that moment? As they get caught up in the revelation that God makes everything Work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. Do you know who wrote that? They get caught up in the revelation that Jesus is into repairing destinies. That Jesus can take our very worst moment, our, our memories of pain, the things we're most ashamed about and rewrite them to become doorways into our destiny. They get caught up in the moment. They look at each other and there's no record of any kind of tension, any kind of, well, we'll fill this out. There's only the record that Saul and Barnabas spent a whole year teaching with them and the church in Antioch embraced him. Why? Because a bruised reed, he will not break. And a faintly burning wick, he will not snuff out. It's justice to Jesus. And the way that Jesus brings justice is by putting us in families where we can walk at our destiny. The very ones that Paul persecuted became his home base. The very ones that he scattered became his sending center. Why am I telling you this? Because when we talk about laborers being sent, we gotta, we gotta throw away this illusion that laborers come in Amazon packages.
We gotta throw away this illusion that like the Avengers are gonna show up. <laughs> Laborers don't come in fully healed, fully anointed, fully ready to take the gospel to the nations. They come in as bruised reeds and faintly burning wicks. And God raises up families, spiritual families, where his presence can dwell, where they get around them and hold them long enough where they can stand up straight again and have confidence. God builds families. It's called church, crew. But God builds presence-centered families that get around them and go, you know what? Like Barnabas, I think Jesus is saying this to you. I don't know if I can even believe. I think God's saying that to you, man. takes mothers and fathers and spiritual families that are committed to bu building an environment where people's destinies start getting restored and they start walking on the poema again. Antioch is not just about sending missionaries. It's about repairing people's destinies. It's people, you walk in the door and they go, I see God's poema on your life. You might not see it, you're bruised and discouraged, but I'm gonna keep telling you, you got a destiny. There's a whole generation out there right now, bruised and broken. They're off the destiny track. They got church pain, they got no confidence in what God said over them. And those are the very ones that are gonna break open the gospel in the unreached world. There is no Captain America Christian out there that we're waiting for. They don't exist. It's just Gen Z. <laughs> in Tarsus. It's Gen Z and Tarsus. Come on, the word of the Lord. Come on, I don't even know. I, man, I've been this, heard by so many leaders, I don't even know if I want to go to church anymore. God's raising up Antiochs. That will be the place where he can start repairing destinies where confidence is restored in the grace of God, where, peop where people can walk in and experience an environment where bruised reeds get stood up, strengthened in confidence, and then anointed with an assignment. Paul had a book of prophetic words, but he had no assignment till he got in a family. It's true. God's raising up Antiochs all over the earth. They're gonna be these pools of Bethesda. That's right. People are gonna walk in bruised, broken, faintly burning, and there's gonna be people there contending for their destinies to be repaired. And the dissonance start gonna start, this is gonna start sounding more like a harmony. And people are gonna start walking out their destinies. The reason I tell you that tonight, and this is where we're ending, is that some of you, feel very much like Saul in Tarsus. And you're in the room because I want to be a Barnabas to you right now and say the story's not over. God actually did speak to you. You actually did obey and now you're getting tested. You're getting tested You had leaders and other leaders, they, didn't, they, they wounded you. But you still have a destiny. You still have assignments ahead of you and it's time to get back on your destiny track. It's time to say yes again. It's time to take yourself off of the bench, off the sidelines and get back in the game. I believe in the sovereignty of God. I believe you're in the room because you need to hear this. Some of you need to hear this. You've put yourself on the sideline because of shame, because of a past failure, and Jesus is going, I want you in the game with me. I want you in the game with me. It's 
Some of you, you're like Saul, and, you're, and you showed up at, at Antioch, and you look around and go, oh, man, there's history that I got to deal with here. Jesus goes, yeah, that's how I'm going to repair your destiny. I'm going to put you in a family, and I'm going to give you an assignment. Let's stand together.